Limit channels, what you need to be on the lookout for later this hour. And let's get you up to speed on the market action. I'm um, looking at the Wi-Fi Interactive here where we see a rally, although the Dow is actually unchanged at the moment. But the Nasdaq up two-tenths of a percent, the Russell 2000 up about one percent, and there is a Dow flashing negative. And looking at the sector action today, we see staples, consumer staples in the lead, up seven-tenths of a percent, followed by materials, industrials, and utilities. Only consumer discretionary here remains in the red. And want to get a quick check of the bond market, the 10-year T note yield that is up one basis point to 3.9 percent and got to go over some uh, quickly some uh, PCE inflation data this morning and in fact we're not even talking about inflation we're talking about a decrease of one tenth of a percent as I said before the lowest since April 2020 durable goods also coming in a little hot and University of Michigan sentiment up to about 69.7 just a little bit higher than expected but Josh, this is a big day for the big guy in the North Pole. I know you've been tracking this. Yeah, this is the start of the so-called, this is a special day. Yes. This is the start of the so-called Santa Claus rally, right? This is a seasonal trend traders, investors pay attention to. And Craig Johnson over at Piper pointing out, since 1928, bit of history here, the market has rallied, he says, an average of 1.7% between the last five days of December and the first two days of the new year. And you can actually bet on that, Jared. That is a 79% positivity rate. So there's your seasonal trend to watch. Johnson, by the way, he's obviously a technician by training over there at Piper, expects any pullbacks on the SPX, the S&P 500, to remain shallow here, he says. You know, funny thing about the Santa Claus rally mm. indicator, and it is an indicator, it's that uh, if it flashes positive, that's actually a pretty good sign that the uh, year, the following year, the entire year is going to end positive. Mm. And if it ends neg negative, this portends potential bearish action. action. And uh, I can go back to 2008. Um, that was one of the years where the uh, financial crisis was getting into full swing, but the Santa Claus rally portended some of that. And in fact, if you take the entire month of January, there's so much going on with politics and changes in leadership and everything else that January has a very good predictive value of the entire year as well. So in other words, even if you're on vacation, you're not trading, you should be, be, be paying attention. I'm counting on this, Josh. I'm taking January off. <laughs> also, you mentioned that that uh, inflation data, which I thought was really interesting, too. Um, David Rosenberg, the economist and strategist, Rosie, right? love him. Love Rosie, says, here's what he told his clients off that, says inflation is conclusively in the rear view mirror. He's positive. Now, I know that's sort of a debatable <laughs> point. We know that. Um, you know, some are saying, listen, you, there's certain upside risks. They'll point to sure. um, easing financial conditions. Maybe they'll look at housing recovery. But interesting take there. All right. Well, we're going to have to, uh, we want to continue the markets discussion. And we are an hour away from the close right now. Major averages on track for an eighth straight winning week as Wall Street looks ahead to extend the year end rally. And with that comes, uh, with the new year comes new investment opportunities. And here with more on how to invest in 2024 is Michelle Martin. She is the president of Prosperity in Eisner Amper Company. And thank you for joining us here today. Uh, you've been hearing us uh, talk about the latest economic data, uh, final inflation print of the year. Uh, can we say that safely inflation is in the rearview mirror or might we take issue with that? I would absolutely agree that we're looking at the inflation in the rearview mirror. Um, and so I look forward to, uh, thanks of all, first of all, for having me today. I really appreciate being here, especially in, when we're in such a scenario of some positive news. Um, what we're seeing is that inflation is paused and that the Fed at, at worst will stay steady for a little bit longer. But we're definitely seeing signs that there will be rate cuts going into 2024, which is great news. And Michelle, when do you think, you know, obviously there's debate about this uh, among a lot of smart people. When you look ahead now, when do you think they cut, Michelle, and how deeply do you think they cut? Well, there's talk that of a cut in March, but the Fed is pausing on that. I, I believe that they will hold steady, that the Fed will hold steady for a bit of time just to make sure that inflation is in the rearview mirror. And there's uh, the Fed is signaling three rate cuts. I would tend to stick with what the Fed says. There's a saying out there, don't fight the Fed. I think there's a lot of talk right now in the market that there could be more rate cuts. 
but there's a lot of optimism and I would be of the mindset that it's um, fairly steady with um, ending next year at around 4%. Um, we're at we're at three uh, on the 10 year, uh, we're just close to four. Um, and um, if we if we see maybe three cuts, um, you know, seeing it go down, but I'm not sure I would expect six cuts next year. Well, and the other, the flip side of that, if there are six cuts, that could be in response to some deteriorating economic data, and that might mean recession. And so uh, I guess I, what I want to ask you is, what are your recession expectations for 2024? Uh, lots of people expected it coming into the present year, and it didn't pan out. Well, from a recession standpoint, I think higher interest rates do put stress on consumers. They also make uh, business owners think about decisions in terms of um, purchasing equipment, expanding, hiring new employees. So it is very possible, and I think we can expect to see a bit of a slowdown due to higher interest rates. The question is, is it enough that it's called a recession, or do we just go to a very low growth rate going into 2024? I think if we see uh, a true recession, uh, which is is relatively unlikely, it'll be very mild. Um, but I think that what I'm hearing anecdotally from clients um, and business owners is that they are being very cautious going into the new year. Um, and higher interest rates basically um, force us to make choices that perhaps we didn't have to make when interest rates were um, so much lower. And Michelle, given your outlook for the economy in 2024, so you know you see a slowing economy, maybe even a mild downturn. What, what does that mean, Michelle, for your outlook on corporate earnings next year? I, I think that uh, we're, we're watching that as it relates to corporate earnings. I think companies are um, being really cautious. We're seeing that um, there are cuts going um, on across um, different different sectors. Um, I think corporate earnings are going to be um, relatively uh, stable. I don't see that it's gonna be a blowout year, but I think it's gonna be very normalized. I think it's watching fundamentals and understanding that um, there are, Nike just announced um, some major cuts that will happen in the second half of the year. So I think what we're gonna see is um, nothing blowout in terms of corporate earnings, but definitely uh, companies watching the bottom line and anticipating making change, changes as needed. Michelle, we got to talk about AI because artificial intelligence has been one of the huge themes of this year. And Bitcoin kind of arrived back on the scene recently as it hovers around 45,000. What's your view heading into the new year? We got some exciting new asset classes, but in general, what are you expecting for stocks? Uh, for stocks going forward into 2024, you know, we're coming off of a pretty rough year, uh, more than a pretty rough year in 2022. Uh, we've seen a very nice rally uh, through throughout the year um, with a just a touch of volatility. I would expect that we're looking at a more normalized return in the markets. Um, not not an S&P in the 20% range, but much more normalized, um, high single digits, low double digits, um, kind of business as usual. Um, when we are looking at what's happening with interest rates, it's also giving individuals an opportunity uh, to move to the fixed income market and get pretty stable returns. So I think that will also have an effect um, overall on the market, which um, is, you know, people don't need to rely on equities uh, to get that return when you've got bonds that are returning five to six percent. So it'll be more of an equalization and a balance uh, for individuals that are long term investors. And Michelle, last question here. So you, you do see opportunity in the fixed income market. Where, where exactly, Michelle? You know, is it treasuries, corporates, munis? Uh, it's, it's really across the board. I think that, you know, Extending duration is really critical right now. So the municipal bond market, um, there, there are opportunities there that we haven't seen in literally a decade. Uh, and uh, same thing ultimately with, with corporates. I think one of the things we have to be thoughtful about when we've been working with clients um, in our portfolios over the last couple of years, we've really leaned into corporate bonds. And we've also leaned into um, some high yield and um, have a bit of credit risk. 
that if we start to see a slowdown, we'll need to we'll need to um, um, make a shift on that, and that would that would um, spell well for just just really riding um, the curve a little bit more and um, making sure that we're more at an intermediate duration and locking in some of these longer term rates. All right, Michelle, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today for that investment advice and happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. Thank you. Now let's get to some trending tickers in today's trade. First to up, shares of Karuna Therapeutics. They are surging today. That's after announcing Bristol Myers will acquire the drug developer for $14 billion. Shares of Bristol Myers edging higher here. So that's the headline here, uh, Jared. Bristol Myers yes. going to buy uh, Karuna, $14 billion. That's three thirty dollars a share in cash. Karuna, uh, a schizophrenia drug developer, a company apparently expecting a decision from the FDA there by September 2024. Reports noting uh, this drug could generate as much as $4 billion by 2020, and the transaction, it sounds like, expected to close first half of next year. Yeah, and I do have uh, some commentary by the street on this deal. Cantor, which rates the stock a buy, or a neutral actually, with a price target of 55, says the deal is, quote, absolutely a step in the right direction, and it fuels the neurology as a growth pillar narrative that BMI has been pushing. Also, one more by Mizuho, rates KRTX a buy, price target 245. Seeing the deal receiving less regulatory scrutiny and more easily receive FTC approval. Here's a quote, given current scarcity value of high profile, high revenue potential, de-risked assets such as KRTX, we wouldn't rule out the possibility that builder bidders could emerge. So uh, more M&A in the space, been kind of a dearth this year, and we're gonna be talking more about that with some of the guests, but uh, we wanna move on to shares of Rocket Lab. They're taking off today after winning a $515 million US government contract. Under the agreement, Rocket Lab will manufacture, deliver, and operate 18 space vehicles. And I do have uh, some commentary on this as well. Um, let me just find this in my notes here. Here, there we go. Here's City, rates of stock a neutral, price tag target of $5.25. Says he believes the contract is for a communications mission, given the cost per satellite and Rocket Lab's expertise in the area, saying it looks like a firm fixed price award with some level of developmental work. And uh, also likes related, uh, related to that is the integration of the payload. So lots of uh, space themes going on here with this company. Yeah, and uh, by the way, unlike Bristol by Meyer, Myers, by the way, which even though it's down about 30% this year, most of the name is still on the sidelines, analysts are fans of this one, Jared. You have 80% who cover this name say you should buy it. And here's your, your bullish take from the team at Stiefel, by the way, on this, on this new contract we're talking about. They called it meaningful. They told their clients they have, you know, just basically having a separate subsidiary equipped to handle national security programs means, in their opinion, the company's creating differentiation, driving value in a, in a market they say poised to grow, given the, just the increased needs of the U.S. government. Stiefel has a buy on this one. Price target is 10. All right. And actually, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive real quick here. I just want to pull up Rocket Lab and do a little technical analysis. This is uh, from the beginning here, and uh, you can see... This was a SPAC that came to market at about $10 a share, so it's about trading a half of that right now. Um, and $5 has been a floor, and we've seen a little bit of liftoff here, but it's been rough. And, you know, taken as a whole, SPACs, well, that entire group seemed to have died off in 2022 during that nasty yep. bear market. So yep. not a surprise there, but uh, if you look at the year to date, looks like it's improving quite a bit. Yeah, but today's gain, nice jump. And finally, let's check out Coinbase here, climbing today after a bullish call from JMP, the firm nearly doubling its price target for Coinbase to $200 from $107. So that's, that's the move. This is JMP's uh, Devin Ryan telling his clients at Coinbase. Actually, he told me, actually kind of reminds him of Amazon, Jared, because Coinbase, like Amazon, he says, skating, in his opinion, to where the puck is going, raises target, this is a big one, from 107 to 200. So a nice big move there. Um, of course, Coinbase has enjoyed this staggering run this year. It's up about 400%. That's his, obviously Bitcoin rebounding on a bet that Gary Gensler and his team at the SEC are going to green light a spot Bitcoin ETF. Ryan says he doesn't expect a smooth performance for the industry of the stock, but the industry is here to stay, he says, and will be much larger over the next 10 years with Coinbase, he argues, continuing to operate at the forefront. I'll tell you what, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive here, and I'm going to chart Coinbase from the IPO. Uh, we started out high with huge expectations, and 
the IPO managed to talk to, or excuse me, top tick Bitcoin itself in the entire crypto market, um, and it was down in 2022 quite a bit. Of course, we had all the bankruptcies, but Coinbase, for me, has been a story about SEC regulation. They've gone head to head, toe to toe with the SEC. We're not doing very well uh, in 21, 20, 20, 2021, and 2022. A couple of missteps there, but. It seems like Gary Gensler now in the SEC is kind of yeah. on the back foot and yep. uh, lots of optimism for crypto. And this is the time that institutions are, I, it seems real this time, as opposed yeah. to before when uh, blockchain was just kind of uh, undeveloped and DeFi had to go through its growing pains. It seems like uh, this next leg up could be the final institutionalization of Coinbase and crypto that everybody's been waiting for. Now, what'll be interesting is, let's say if and when yes. Gensler green light that spot Bitcoin ETF, is that, is that a positive catalyst that moves us, the, you know, the space higher? Or have we talked about it so much? Sell the news. Sell the news. <laughs> yeah, it could be know. either way. I think the fundamentals of Bitcoin and crypto itself are going to be enough to overcome any sell the news. That's just a personal opinion. We are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the investor guide to the 2024 election. We reveal what a presidential election means for your investments. In a new installment of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye, we're going to look at two sides of the auto energy space and tell you which stocks to buy and which one you should avoid. And fake Ozempic. The FDA says it has seized thousands of units of counterfeit Ozempic. We bring you the details of that story when Yahoo Finance returns.
A new survey from Taneo showing optimism about deal activity next year. The results showing 68% of CEOs and top investors see an uptick in deals next year, despite increased regulatory pressure, higher costs of capital. Joining us now is Taneo's CEO, Paul Keery. Paul, it is great to see you. Thank you for being here. Let me start with that stat, Paul, because it's it sticks out to you. So the uptick in M&A, nearly 70% expect a sizable M&A uptick next year, which is interesting because you think there's Lena Khan and the FTC, you know, ambitious, aggressive, higher cost of capital. So what, what explains that? There's a couple of things, and it's interesting. That, that trend is common across the world, not yeah. just in the U.S., but U.S. has shown some of the highest senses of confidence. I think there's a view that access to capital will be a little easier next year. Um, inflationary pressures will ease. And I'll also emanate from a defensive and offensive perspective expected next year. So there's been a lot of, a lot of been trophies out there. There's a yeah. lot of assets that people covet. There's been some dulling of the m and market this year, which I think is set to release part next year. And, do you, and Paul, I'm just sure, do you delve into a little bit of what they're looking, when they say they want you know, more deal making, is it because they want to move into new markets, new technologies, they want to acquire talent? It is um, across the board, mm. Josh, and I think what's interesting is that investors and CEOs, as they had last year in our survey, have a different view on economic optimism for 2024. Last year, you could argue investors were right if you look at the, the data on the markets, S&P, year-over-year basis. But this year, it feels like there is a sense of caution by CEOs on next year from a macroeconomic perspective, but there is there is a lot of dry powder, there is confidence and access to capital, and there is a need to make some strategic moves in the market next year. Yeah. Uh, this has been a year where artificial intelligence, AI, has been a huge theme, and I'm wondering what kind of conversations you're having with clients, because AI is so vast, and um, it's not really new, but the way it's being used is new, and there are so many different facets of it. What are people, what are your clients coming to you and talking about? This year, Jared, is a 20-point increase year over year on AI investing, putting new AI line items into the spreadsheet for business planning into 2024 versus 22 to 23. Um, and U.S. is an even higher number in terms of AI investing. So the allocation of capital to future opportunity is there. CEOs, however, anecdotally feel that they're being sold to a lot. Mm. The what, why they need AI, but not yet confident that has been addressed by the market in terms of the why and the how. Yeah. How is it going to deliver consumer outcomes? How is it going to improve efficacy? How is it going to improve outcomes from a, from a P&L perspective? So they're building um, reserve, reserves on the cost side. They're going to invest next year, but I think it's unclear yet as to whether they're, they're happy that they offer and the spread of technologies that they're clear that's going to deliver value for their customers. Also, switch gears, I want to get your take, Paul, on another issue. What are, the, what are you hearing from the CEOs about these efforts to, to diversify their supply chains next year? Is that still a pretty powerful trend? It is, yeah. Deglobalization and, and supply chain tend to be, in our survey year over year, inextricably linked. And China has um, emerged this year as being more important than last year as a key customer and a key access market which is suggesting to us that the preparations that have been made on understanding, protecting, and including resiliency in supply chain for a deglobalized world, there's a bit more confidence yep. uh, that they're ready for whatever the deglobalized world will throw at them next year. And did you have line of sight, Paul, when they were talking about diversifying their supply chains about where? Is it, you know, is it onshoring? Is it, is it Viet in Vietnam? Is it India? It's onshoring, it's friendshoring, it's yeah. understanding where the political divide may be in a geopolitical tumult in the future as a consequence with the West, how it faces China. Uh, and you see multiple markets that have uh, you know, a strong alignment with China. They leverage the Huawei network, they, they're firm sellers of their, uh, of their bond offers to the Chinese market. Uh, Chinese are big investors in those markets, so friendshoring is obviously those markets that are very definitively Western aligned. But the confidence year over year, Josh, is interesting. China was more of a bogeyman market for political, geopolitical, macroeconomic reasons. They have invested significantly in protecting supply chain um, resilience, but there's an increased confidence that China as a market is not a market that they should step away from.
Yeah. Are there any other markets around the globe that are perhaps up and coming or might be dealing with some conflict, um, might not be on the surface uh, the best bet seemingly, but uh, under the hood, you like the opportunities there? I think when, uh, you mentioned AI, Jared, mm -hmm. earlier. So there's a little bit of an AI digital divide creeping into the global system. Uh, the level of investment on similar sized companies in developing versus developed world uh, is stark contrast. So I think the opportunity perhaps suggests is what is going to be the, the second mover advantage opportunity for developing markets on AI. Paul, I'll get you out of here on this. You know, today you've got clients all over the world. Are the concerns you hear, Paul, are they different regionally? Meaning, are your, are your clients in Europe when they express concerns about next year to you, are they, are they much different than, let's say, the CEOs you're talking to here in the States? A couple of points that's interesting. So as you may have seen, uh, UK-based CEOs have significant angst over their UK listing. About 30% of them are considering a listing in a new market, with US being the largest beneficiary of that, those considerations. And that's a couple of reasons pension funds uh, not investing as much historically in the markets, a view that the, uh, the regulatory and enforcement market is a little bit constrictive. And as a consequence, I think there's a big divide between the UK and the US. But second point is there's the level of bullishness in the US market from an investor perspective is significant year over year. And I was listening to your piece earlier today, Jared, mm. you know, the last year of a democratic uh, term yeah. always represents value and opportunity in the, in the equity side. Uh, and so I think there's a bullishness on the investor side as they look into the US market, particularly in 2024. But not surprisingly, if you're a CEO, you might not share the same um, bullishness because you're not looking at the spreadsheet of his history. You're looking at um, change in administration, whether it's a new Biden administration or a new Republican candidate. You're looking at expansion or contraction of industrial policy. You're looking at uh, a soft landing or otherwise of the economy. You're thinking about political disruption as not just a, a politically disruptive moment, but an economic, social, and political disruptive moment as well. So it's fascinating. I think your piece earlier was, was fun. I, I appreciate that. A loyal Yahoo Finance viewer here in the yeah. making. Uh, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your insights. Paul Keery, Teneo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Happy holidays. You too. The FDA seizing thousands of fake units of Ozempic, the diabetes weight loss drug, and warning that there could still be counterfeits currently in the U.S. Anjali Kemlani joins us with the details. Anj. That's right, Jared. Uh, Novo Nordis Ozempic really seeing a continued attempt to really get the hands on any product available, including counterfeits. The FDA, the FDA now having to intervene and take these off market, Novo Nordisk and the FDA looking at those thousands of one milligram Ozempic, trying to figure out um, what the product is in there. It has been linked to five adverse events so far. Uh, but we do know that the, the giveaway was the needles this time. And the FDA is warning that there could be some issues with those needles. That is the problem with the counterfeits right now. This is an ongoing issue. They first identified some about a month ago in the US and previously in October, a similar issue uh, or rather a different issue, but also counterfeits in the EU and the UK uh, with the one milligram doses where the labels uh, were in German and they were counterfeit products being sold. They've also found Ozempic products that have insulin in them in the past. So a lot just to, you know, sort of define the demand that we've seen for this blockbuster drug this year. The FDA and its counterparts around the globe constantly having to chase after all these counterfeit products for the entire year. All right, Anjali, story we're going to keep watching. Thank you so much. And coming up, the investor guide to the 2024 election. We're going to reveal what a presidential election means for your portfolio.
2024 U.S. presidential election is in just under a year. As candidates battle it out for the seat in the Oval Office, AI experts are warning on the potential massive upswing in disinformation and misinformation in the campaigns. And here with an investor's guide for what 2024 can offer and what this means for AI and social media companies, let's go to now Dan Howley, Yahoo Finance's own. Dan, what are the details? That's right, Jared. The AI revolution has really supercharged a lot of companies uh, as far as spending and really just generated tons of conversation as to the benefits of it. But there also are some drawbacks, and those include the spread of disinformation and misinformation. Um, part of that has to do with people being able to generate lifelike images, videos, and audio increasingly uh, of individuals uh, and basically allowing them to manipulate the news. And so we've seen some instances of this. There was uh, an image that had spread earlier in the year uh, about uh, appearing to be an explosion outside the Pentagon. It sent shares on Wall Street sliding. Uh, they quickly recovered, though, uh, because it was clear that this was just a fake. The Pentagon responded, saying that there was no explosion at all, everything was fine, uh, and that this was just uh, an AI manipulation. But we also saw, uh, prior to uh, former President Trump's uh, uh, arrest in New York, uh, images that were generated of him running from police being gang tackled. Uh, we've also seen uh, a deep fake of uh, Vladimir Putin speaking to Vladimir Putin. So uh, it's it's everywhere now. And some of the experts that I spoke to say that we're going to see a tsunami of disinformation around 2024. So what does this mean for companies? Well, some of the experts I spoke to said, look, it, it comes down to uh, whether or not they have robust terms and conditions, meaning that they say that what people use their services for have to be uh, law abiding and not uh, for nefarious purposes. And uh, it comes down to reputation. So uh, if, for instance, say uh, Microsoft's platforms or open AIs or Meta's, Google's, Amazon's, whichever are used to generate disinformation, uh, then they would take a black eye. Now, does that mean that uh, investors would necessarily pull out uh, or that customers would necessarily pull out. It depends on how big of a black eye that really is. The flip side of things, there's a social media aspect of this, uh, which we saw uh, issues around during the uh, uh, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, uh, where uh, Facebook, uh, excuse me, Meta, uh, Twitter at the time, they pulled back, uh, YouTube pulled back on some of the people that were spreading disinformation and misinformation uh, and tried to clear up the platforms. We saw, obviously, issues there uh, with share prices. So, you know, it really comes down to the moves that the companies make to prevent this uh, and how bad, if it does happen, uh, the reaction will be. And I think that, you know, if you look at the terms and conditions of some of the bigger companies, they lay out pretty clearly that you're not supposed to use their services for anything nefarious, as you would imagine that they, they would say. All right, Dan Halley, thank you, sir, for that. And Merry Christmas, Dan. Merry Christmas. Take care. The market's riding the start of a Santa Claus rally into the close of 2023, and we're looking ahead to next year and how investors can prepare their portfolios. And today we're focusing on the presidential election. If history tells us anything, election years tend to be solid for the markets and even indicate who could win the race for the White House. As part of our 2024 Investor Guide, we ask, what does the political cycle mean for markets and what will be the best play? Jeff Buckbinder, financial chief equity strategist at LPL, joins us now. Uh, great to see you. Maybe just listen, big picture, walk us through what the election can mean for investors. Lots of already balls in the air next year, Jeff. You know, we got, got the Fed, the economy, geopolitical risk. How should investors think about a presidential election? Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me on. Um, so, you know, certainly we expect gains next year. That would be consistent with the uh, historical pattern, right? On average, in an election year, the S&P 500 is up about 7%. Now, that pales in comparison to what you typically get in year three, right? The pre-election year, as we saw this year, uh, is the strongest of the four years, the average gain has been 17% and we're gonna do uh, certainly well north of 20. So sure it's good, uh, but uh, I think a little bit of political uncertainty in general uh, creeps in and, and you have a little bit more of a, of a choppy market, maybe upwardly trending, but still choppy. And there's certainly fundamental reasons to expect a little bit of chop uh, as we go through um, 2024 with valuations a little bit higher, you know, the economy uh, poised to slow. I, I will make um, you know one point up front here about 
the economy that the you know if you look back at history the economy is really the biggest driver right of not just how elections turn out but how markets do so um you know if we continue to have surprises on the us economy like we've had in 2023 uh then no doubt this market can do quite a bit better than that historical average. Let me ask you about the economy here. A big talk about in 2023 this year has been recession, did not materialize, but whether or not there is a recession can be very predictive of whether or not of who be, who wins the next presidential election. And we still have a year left or not quite a year left until the election, but enough time for something to develop. Could you talk to me about some of the stats surrounding recessions and their influence on the presidential election? Yeah, heavy influence, uh, no doubt. The the recession is actually a perfect 17 for 17 calling elections. If you have a recession in the two years leading up to a presidential election, uh, the incumbent loses. If you don't, the incumbent wins. So, you know, hard to say whether we're going to have a recession uh, next year. This is maybe a coin flip. But if we do, that's going to be a real tall hill for uh, President Biden to climb. Now, if there is any year uh, where you would think of maybe a recession could be mild, maybe some one-offs, the uniqueness of this economic cycle could actually lead to a situation where you have a short, mild recession and, and Biden potentially gets uh, reelected. We've, we've seen it throughout this cycle uh, that the uh, post-pandemic period has been unusual and very difficult for economists and, and strategists to predict. And Jeff, historically speaking, do, do does the market, do stocks, do they do, tend to do better under Republicans or Democrats? Yeah, since World War II, they've done a little better uh, under Democratic presidents, although if you go back further than that, it actually flips. Uh, looking at modern history, though, uh, a little bit under Democrats. But I think what's probably more important is to look at whether you have gridlock, right? You get a few extra points of returns historically if you're in divided government. And it looks like that's probably what we're going to have. Now, there are a number of different ways, um, you know, where this could shake out. But if you have, um, you know, the Republicans potentially uh, take the Senate, uh, you could either have the Democrats uh, take the House or or hold the White House. You could get gridlock a number of different ways. Uh, and that can take a little bit of the uncertainty out that tends to hurt markets leading up to uh, an election. And, and this time, it's really about tax policy, I think, more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the Trump tax cuts expiring in, in 2025. And how those are handled uh, will certainly be a meaningful market event. Could you just briefly run down how some of those changes, and you said pr pretty much around the corner in 2025, if nothing changes, how that would affect the average investor? Sure. Well, um, you know, Biden has said that uh, he's not going to raise taxes on incomes below 400000 But investors over that will see tax increases uh, most likely if Biden uh, you know, wins uh, re-election, although it certainly depends on what happens in, in, in Congress. Uh, you could see the investment tax uh, go back up. You could even see corporate rates go up. Uh, so uh, no doubt the, um, uh, you know, the Biden campaign is running on higher taxes on the wealthy they've you know that message has been consistent for a number of years now uh, they're likely to reiterate that message all right we got to leave it there but uh really appreciate uh, some of these fun insights you have for us jeff buckbinder thank you again thanks scott a lot and happy holidays you too Coming up, we're going to break down how the latest inflation reports, which show prices cooling, is actually negatively affecting President Biden's approval ratings. More on this after the break.
Synopsis reportedly is in talks to acquire Ansys. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. Ansys currently has a market value of about $30 billion. The deal with Synopsis could be struck early in 2024. So this one is interesting. Again, Jared, yes. uh, coming, from, coming from the journal, um, it would mean if it happens, a big new design software giant. Um, Ansys market value about $30 billion did per the journal about $2 billion in 2022. Could have, in terms of timeline, could happen as early as next year. So some deal, pretty big deal making perhaps to kick off the new year. We just spoke with mm -hmm. Taneo CEO on the show and they surveyed execs and found that most do expect to pick up an M&A next year. You know, on the one hand, we we're talking about how, you know, it's still kind of a relatively tough regulatory backdrop, Lena Khan, the FTC. On the other hand, you know, financing, financing costs coming down. So maybe the first signs here of what they were serving. Synopsis, by the way, strong run this year, up about 70%. Analysts are fans, 14 buys, two holds, one sell. Its customers don't hurt, names like NVIDIA and, and AMD, among others. Yeah, it's um, a fairly big company too. And by the way, just this story broke earlier today. We didn't know the suitor who was going to buy Ansys, but there was a Bloomberg report that was circulating this. So we actually have analyst commentary from earlier in the day uh, who did not have the privilege of knowing who uh, the suitor would be. But here's Bloomberg Intelligence saying, with the largest market share of the simulation software market at 42%, Ansys is an attractive M&A target. KeyBank, which holds it a uh, sector weight, analysts is saying that Synopsys may be the most, uh, Synopsys, so that's the eventual suitor, just guessing there, may make the most strategic sense in terms of a p potential bio buyer of Ansys, given the two companies have shared opportunities and overlap in 3D IC. However, Synopsys may not have the cash means for the $28 yeah. billion, because yeah. um, this is not a cheap company. If we go to the right. Wi-Fi Interactive, I'll show you Synopsys synopsis right here. This has a market cap of 80 billion. I'm circling that right now. Well, you move down to ANSYS, 31 billion. That's a big difference. Yep, sure is. And synopsis, by the way, we should mention decline to comment on the rumor and speculation, but a story, of course, we will continue to cover here. Uh, today's PCE data, meanwhile, indicate inflation is slowing, likely cementing rate cuts by the Federal Reserve next year. But this positive data is not helping President Biden's approval rating as he continues to fall behind his GOP rival Donald Trump in the polls. Our very own Rick Newman has been digging through that data. Rick. Yeah, it's just uh, the year is ending poorly for Biden. You just showed a Monmouth University uh, poll result. Um, he's down to 34 percent approval in that poll. That's the lowest of his presidency so far. And uh, I I'm kind of uh, struck by that. Um, you know, he's less popular now than he was in the summer of 2022, which is when gasoline prices hit five dollars a gallon and we had the inflation rate hitting uh, its peak of 8.9%, basically all the way up to 9%. So, I mean, we understand that um, while the rate of inflation is coming down, it's now around 3%, 3.1%. Um, that doesn't mean prices are coming down. Prices are still high. Uh, but gas prices are coming down. I mean, uh, they're, they're basically at normal levels, around $3 a gallon, $3.10 a gallon. And, and Biden is just getting absolutely no love from voters. Um, it's like he can do nothing right. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is going to improve in 2024. Well, let's pivot now to a story that's making the moves in the market today, and that is investors. They are betting that the government could put a pin in the Nippon acquisition of U.S. Steel. We remember all the hay that was made by President Trump back in the day about protectionism and tariffs, and the steelmakers were front and center in his, uh, in his campaigns. Uh, what do we know right now? Uh, well, so U.S. Steel has been trying to sell itself. Um, I mean, it thinks that, you know, it will just do better for shareholders. Uh, if there's some consolidation in the industry. And of course, the big long-term story here is that China has risen and it now dominates the global steel industry and undercuts uh, American producers. We still make a lot of steel in the United States for domestic consumption. So Nippon, Nippon is a Japanese-owned uh, company. Jap Japan is a close ally, so it's not like a Chinese company wants to buy U.S. steel. This would have to go through a, a government security review no matter what. Uh, and Biden has now weighed in and says uh, this uh, this deal requires serious scrutiny. So he didn't say it shouldn't happen. Um, he just said he's concerned about it. So that makes me think that uh, the Biden administration might not actively lobby against this deal. 
but there uh, there might have to be some conditions that are not contained in the uh, current agreement between the two companies. Uh, so it, uh, from last time I checked, U.S. U.S. steel stock price not at not at the uh, what the deal price would be, which is about fifty five dollars. So it's discounted from that, su suggesting investors think there is some chance this could fall through. So I think this is going to be a significant story at the beginning of twenty four. Yeah, we'll certainly uh, be uh, prepared to follow it as it evolves there, and probably going to hear a lot about it from President ex President Trump himself. Thank you for that, Rick Newman. Bye, guys. As DealFlow works to recover from the lack of activity by private equity firms, a new wrinkle is added into the mix. The Federal Trade Commission and Justice Department have set new merger guidelines, and our next guest says it's set to usher in the biggest changes to the way regulators review M&A in the U.S. in 40 years. And here to discuss, we have Mitch Berlin, EY, America's Vice Chair of Strategies and Transactions. And... Uh, Thank you for joining us here, Mitch. This does indeed seem like a big deal. It might fly over the head of a lot of people, M&A, so what? But we're talking trillions of dollars over the year in potential transactions, and uh, not the least of which we see all the antitrust regulations going on with big tech. Uh, please just break it down for us. Why is this important? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. These are the largest changes to the M&A guidelines in the last 40 years. And it's important to note and remember, these are guidelines, not laws, but they do give us insight on how the FTC and DOJ are going to be evaluating deals going forward. So a couple changes. One is they've lowered the threshold by which they would consider a deal to be anti-competitive. So in the past, the threshold in this consolidation index would be a 200-point change. They've now lowered that to a 100-point change. So more deals will come under their scrutiny. Two is they're looking at roll-ups, and this is going to impact private equity. So small deals that ultimately can be rolled up and become anti-competitive is another area that they're going to be looking at. And so as PEs do roll-up deals, this is something that's clearly going to impact them. They're going to have to prepare to be um, to be prepared to discuss uh, the rationale for that deal and that those deals are not anti-competitive uh, with FTC. And then the other change is really looking at technology companies, specifically companies that have an opportunity to dominate a platform or crush a small competitor coming into the market uh, to keep them from competing against themselves and perhaps uh, limiting R&D and advancements in technology. And the last change is really just around the amount of documentation that can now be required by the FTC and DOJ. And so we're expecting this to increase the deal timeline by about two months in terms of not only accumulating that information, but then the FTC's timeline to review that information as well. And so Mitch, so bottom line, given these guidelines, what, what's your advice to executives, to CEOs who are looking to get deals done in 2024? So a few things, we're telling them to plan early. It's gonna take longer to accumulate the documentation, start earlier, gather that information, and then come up with different scenarios. If you have to divest of assets and businesses yourself or through the target, how does that change your valuation model? How does that change what you're willing to ultimately pay for that transaction? And what are different scenarios that you can play with if you continue to get pushback from the FTC? So plan early uh, and be flexible in what you're willing to do in terms of structuring that deal. Uh, the, the United States is a little bit different than a lot of countries in the way antitrust and mergers and acquisitions are regulated. We have both the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and the DOJ, the Department of Justice. As I understand, one of them will take the lead in a really big high-profile case, and they just kind of switch off. I'm wondering if this new, uh, these new regulations do anything to kind of delineate, maybe uh, increase the number of black lines instead of the gray area where you have just this regulatory overlap and it seems a little uh, messy. Yes, so I, I'm not, I don't have a, an opinion on if that's going to change, but what we do expect is that there'll be greater sharing of information, not just with FTC and DOJ, but with other government organizations mm -hmm. to understand what the impacts are on the labor market and other and other parts of the economy. And Mitch, spinning ahead to 2024, when you look at deal making, um, are there certain sectors, Mitch, you'd be looking to see more activity in others, technology or energy? We are. So technology, energy, life sciences, those are all areas we're expecting a, a pickup in M&A. And that's because for two reasons. One is in general, we expect to pick up an M&A as a cost of capital comes down with the recent announcement 
that we can expect three rate cuts next year. That certainly has stimulated activity. But when you look at those three sectors, what makes them unique is that there has been a decrease in the overall multiple. And so you have a wide, a, a, a narrowing of the bid ask gap with a um, lower with a lower multiple and a lower cost of capital combined. That would suggest that those three sectors are going to uh, continue to do deals and probably be the most active in the market. And in addition to that, life sciences companies have strong balance sheets. And we just saw a deal announced earlier today that would be an all cash deal for life sciences companies, which further supports um, that these companies with strong balance sheets are continuing to do deals. You know, when we think about tech and the government, um, it, it's arguably pretty difficult for the government to come in and uh, regulate the artificial intelligence algorithms that companies are developing to as part of their business. And we talk about takeovers. Uh, it seems like the government has been, has been stuck behind the eight ball a couple of times in the past. You could argue that the, it, with the benefit of hindsight that Facebook's acquisition of, for instance, Instagram for a billion dollars, uh, that was an example of a, a way where the regulators kind of fell back and didn't anticipate the dominance by Facebook as it would eventually. I'm just wondering if there's anything nebulous like that in the artificial intelligence region or arena where we, people are worried about the government being able to regulate a lot of this new technology that's infiltrating our lives. Yeah, I think, you know, I think with the government is looking for the businesses to self-regulate. And so you've seen a lot of these large tech companies um, team together to help self-regulate. But with regards to what the government is specifically doing to regulate AI and, and um, the sort of threats of having automatic intelligence without a conscience, um, doing things that may not be in the best interest of of the economy or the human interest is something that I'm, you know, I think the government, the government's hoping the businesses will self-regulate, but I imagine at some point they're gonna have to jump in as well. All right, Mitch Berlin, thank you so much for your time, your insight today, Mitch, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And coming up, closing bell on Wall Street, we're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers, stay tuned.
You are watching the closing bell on Wall Street, and let's do a quick check of the markets here. Looking at the Wi-Fi Interactive, the Dow ending the day in the red, but uh, all majors plus the Russell 2000 going to end the green, the uh, week in the green. You can see the Russell 2000 up 93 basis points for the day, NASDAQ up about 19, and for the week up 1.21%. And want to get a check on the sector action. Uh, it's been all about the staples today, up three quarters of a percent, followed by materials and healthcare with only consumer discretionary in the red and let's just get a quick check on the week in markets and here's communication services with Meta and Alphabet that is the winner of 2.2 percent and only energy energy is the other sector that is outperforming and we got four in the red there to the way down we are leading with utilities Josh all right and now let's take a look as well at some of the top trending tickers today. We're watching shares of Tencent and NetEase. They take a hit after China announces new regulations targeting spending and engagement on online games. And so that was the headline here, Jared. The yeah. story is Chinese authorities apparently step in, new measures to limit players spending on video games. Investors did get nervous. You saw some names like Tencent, like NetEase, taken on the chin. The draft rules include things like the elimination of rewards for daily logins, eliminating high price transactions of virtual items through auctions. Now, some of our viewers who are in, like, let's say, Take Two or EA may be wondering, okay, what's my exposure there? Michael Pactor at Wedbush says, take a deep breath, relax. This news, he says, should be largely immaterial yeah. to the overall performance of Western video game publishers. I was following this story this morning, and a U.S. ETF called Bets was in the green, so mm. clearly this is a regional issue. Yep. Real quick on the Wi-Fi interaction. Uh, it, there is some spillover from this. You have Tencent. That is this stock here down 9% in the OTC market, still trading a little bit. Uh, that might be on delay. But ownership in Tencent is done by a company called Prosys. They have a big material holding, and you can see they are down 11% uh, today. And then here is another one, NetEase. Uh, that stock is down 16%, and uh, the stock is still up about 20% year-to-date. All right, Lionsgate announcing plans to spin off its studio business in a SPAC deal, valuing the business at $4.6 billion. The transaction, however, will not include the Stars platform, which will continue to be owned wholly by Lionsgate. And I have an interesting uh, commentary here by Seaport, rates the stock a buy, that would be Lionsgate, saying the valuation in the agreement effectively means that buying Lionsgate shares today gives investors the Stars media networks for free versus estimates of 1.6 to 1.8 billion dollars enterprise value. So there you go. I've been trying to get stars for free for years. Uh, but, you know, there's account piggyback in there. Just kind yeah. of blew up with the whole Netflix thing. Right. I mean, it's interesting. So basically Lionsgate, Jared, from my understanding, so Lionsgate Entertainment merges its studio business, blank check company, Screaming right. Eagle, trades on the NASDAQ, deal value. It looks like the deal values the business around 4.6 billion, including debt. Portfolio of content, by the way, properties like Hunger Games, Twilight Saga, John Wick, yes. tremendous. Um, All seven of them. <laughs> deal expected to occur, it looks like, in the spring of next year, at which point, um, according to the reports I'm seeing here, Lionsgate would then own about 87% of total shares, and Screaming Eagle would own about 13%. And Lionsgate, I guess, expected to receive proceeds of about $350 million from the merger. And, and it, we know there's been a lot of talk, reporting, hot talk for some time about this, but you know, different options, you sell the divisions, spin them off. So now at least we, we have a decision here. Yeah, the media business was just made for M&A, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what we're thinking. Heading into 2024, we'll see. Coming up, a new installment of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. It's coming up after the break. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings, and they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. 
and we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. It is a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye, brought to you by E-Trade from Morgan Stanley. Our goal, to help cut through that noise and navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're looking at two sides of the auto energy space with focus on oil and EVs. Oil futures enjoying the biggest weekly gains in two months, whereas EV makers, they are slipping on some geopolitical trade tariffs as well as weakening demand. So what's the best way to play it? I am here now with Robert Shine, Blanky Shine Wealth Management. So your stock to buy here is Occidental Petroleum. And uh, well, we can see this has been a choppy year. This is year to date. Uh, we've seen some highs and lows here. Uh, tell us about this pick. Yeah, we like Oxy. It's clearly been consolidating as we've seen oil, but you know, oil is now consolidated. We believe, we, th we think the setup for 2024 is gonna be better for, for oil. But that being said, Oxy can do well, even if oil doesn't do well. They recently just had a, another, uh, basically, acquisition mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, and that's gonna add to sort of their, their land grab, if you will, the real estate of what they own here, the, the Permian base here. But, you know, we saw sort of a double bottom uh, that we, you know, in the chart earlier sure. on Oxy. But at the same time, you're also looking at, you're investing with Warren Buffett, right? 28%, yes. now he just announced the total accumulation of shares. Uh, so with the consolidation, with sort of the setup for next year of oil, we believe and you know the geopolitical tensions I think oxy is the way to go yeah I, I've read reports about the CEO jet setting to Omaha to speak with the with the Oracle himself but what do you like about this stock what else besides the attractive valuation well again the two-year consolidation right now so okay. we, we haven't seen uh, this right now um, and the risk reward right moving forward uh, and then also if you think about it you want to broaden out your portfolio we're seeing that the markets are now continuing to broaden out sectors like energy haven't performed this year mm -hmm. so we believe that you know reallocate your portfolio no, don't just own the magnificent seven yes. uh, sell into the strength and then rebalance into some sectors that we believe could actually do quite well next year. All right, and on the inflation front, uh, break-evens tend to trade with oil and getting into some bond wonks, wonky stuff that we don't have to, but definitely oil is on the mind of investors in as much as it affects the price of the pump. So how does all this correlate? Yeah, I mean, the, the sensitivity, the, the risk moving forward would be uh, ultimately the geopolitical or the, no, the global environment of the consumer, right? So if the U.S. consumer and the global consumer sort of just run out of gas, if you will, for 2024, and all of the Fed right hikes start you know, hitting uh, the consumer pocketbook, that mm -hmm. could slow down consumption. So that is a risk out there, as in investing, there's always the risk, the other side of the trade. Uh, but I think long-term investors need to look at a company like this, invest with Warren Buffett, I think you'll be just fine. All right, how does investing with Warren Buffett go wrong? Um, I'm seeing the, the recession, the, re the big R word right there. Yeah, exactly what we just described, yeah. is the recession risk moving right. forward. All right, well, let's move on because at the under, other side of the scale, we have Lucid Group. Um, this is one stock that you're avoiding. Uh, just look at the chart here. We've had, it's been very volatile, and I think from the ultimate highs, it's down just an incredible percentage. Yeah, this one's a good buy, uh, meaning we don't own it. We've never owned it for clients. Uh, again, we like the energy space. In the EV space, this is a tough one. Right now, uh, even if you look at the stock, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of sort of negative news surrounding it. Number one, the CFO jumped, you know, um, unexpectedly earlier uh, in last month. We also have, at the, the same time, the EV slowdown that you're seeing. And so the production sort of lucid, right? They, they were gonna deliver 10,000 units and they had to walk that back to about 8,500, okay? So now they're also not beating or meeting to their expectations. And, and their cash the burn rate, rate. Yeah. Um, they could be out of cash within a year, this time next year. Uh, ultimately, Saudi government is, is their backer, 1.8 billion earlier this year. But how long does that last? And again, your competitor, your, your last of the party. You know, it could be a great product, if you will, but it's not a great stock to own. And that's sort of one of the things where, you know, if you've got Tesla, the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla, 
really, you know, hanging out there. Yes. It's going to be hard to, to sort of keep track. And then the CFO even said, hey, listen, or the CEO said, listen, we don't have the entry level in, in play until 2030. So that's also going to help them if the consumers hit, you know, and they're still looking for the EV space, they still have to stretch high for the lucid high-end cars. So for 2024, it's a good buy. All right, now, uh, how does this reverse to the upside here? How, do, how does Lucid become a good potential buy? Well, you did see a little bit of reversal the last few weeks, um, and it's short covering, Yeah. right? Uh, and, and so, again, if you're in that space and you like sort of, you know, thinly traded markets with regards to, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Areas where, where people just pile in and, and try to drive up the stock for so the day. So a short-term punter maybe, um, but not for the longer well, term. It's it's not for the you know faint of heart, and it's not for the true investor. If you're a, a serious investor, you're going to look towards other sectors and other higher quality companies. Well, if the only thing I can think of to turn a company around is a short covering rally <laughs> and perhaps uh, more government handouts, I don't know about that one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to recap, all right, you're, you're telling investors to buy Occidental Petroleum. Uh, that that's based on the stock's attractive valuation, the reward potential, and supply chain and inflation headwinds turning into tailwinds in the new year. And on the other side here, you're saying avoid Lucid Group because of its weak financials, its cash burn, and potential difficulties facing the entire EV industry. Uh, Robert Shine, thank you for stopping by. And thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. That's going to do it all for us today at Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back on Tuesday at 3 p.m. for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Lars, thank you so much for joining me today and congratulations on winning Yahoo Finance's Company of the Year. It must be obvious why you got this this year. What a runaway success here for the company. Tell me about how you're feeling about it. It's obviously a great honor to get that uh, prestigious uh, prize. And in many ways, it's a, it's a good uh, picture of a fantastic year for, for Novo Nordisk and actually a number of years where we've seen a, a very dramatic uh, growth and uh, all based on, on some really interesting uh, and fascinating innovation we've been doing for, for many, many years. So we're really pleased to be in this uh, wonderful spot. Absolutely. And this is, of course, because of Ozempic, Wegovi, the GLP-1 products that have had astounding weight loss results for people. It, it's funny to me because, you know, Ozempic was approved in 2017, Wegovi in 2021. Are you surprised by the fact that a couple years after or several years after this approval, you're suddenly seeing this delayed success? It's, it's a great question because we have been researching in, in this for many decades. We have done BC research for more than 25 years. We have all along felt that it was a really meaningful uh, focus area for us to have, being a, a lead in diabetes care and knowing that many of those who develop type 2 diabetes, they develop it because of, of overweight. So why treat the disease if you can actually prevent it by addressing the underlying causes? But we also know that for many years, anti obesity medicine was not widely used and, and they were not all uh, delivering up against uh, patients and physicians' expectations. So we saw with our latest innovation that uh, we really 
perhaps for the first time met those expectations and a lot of discussion was ongoing about, okay, now there's finally uh, an efficacious uh, treatment for people living with obesity. And then suddenly the whole market takes off and uh, that's really fascinating, but also comes with a lot of hard work because we have to scale up and ramp up manufacturing uh, like we had never done before. But it's all uh, really exciting and I, I feel so proud on behalf of all the great colleagues and uh, really committed employees in Norsk. And it's really a, a credit, uh, you know, getting this prize is really a credit to all of those who go to work each and every day focused on, on helping patients. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the manufacturing. You're investing a lot in that, um, about $4 billion um, for the upcoming years to expand manufacturing almost directly as a result of this. Uh, but do you feel like you may be over-investing considering that there are you know, uh, competitors coming down the pike? There's so many others that are going to be in the space soon. Do you feel like you're on the right track with this? I believe we are, we are ramping up as, as needed. And if you think about it, uh, WHO predicts that by 2030, there'll be a billion, a billion people living with obesity. And, uh, and so far, we're just scratching in the surface uh, what that means in terms of bringing them efficacious medicines. Um, in the US, there's more than 100 million with a BMI above 30. So there's, there's room for competition. There's room for, for choice. As long as products stay safe and they get, say, well above 15% in weight loss, I think you can have a, a serious play. And we have a very uh, strong pipeline coming. We are already now in late stage development of our next generation product. We, uh, we know what will we'll be moving into the pipeline in the coming years in terms of even uh, stronger products. So for us, this is a long time, a long term journey of getting to more and more patients. And I think we have maybe the, one of the best opportunities in driving pop population health intervention and really preventing some of the comorbidities that follows living with obesity. And I think that's a great value add for the individual patient. It's great for society, for the healthcare systems that are struggling in most countries, aging populations uh, and a number of, of burdens on, 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 uh, on governments, uh, driving green transition, handing aging population and, and also now spending increasingly on, on defense, etc. So really, uh, investing in medicines that can drive prevention and improve health outcomes is living the purpose of a company like, like Novo Nordisk. And we're really proud about what contribution we can have in that, uh, that space. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting story because, you know, you were known for insulin for so long and now this expansion, you're giving Wall Street the diversity it has craved for the company's portfolio for so long. But you've also found yourself um, sort of in the common culture, you know, with the mass population that that recognition of the brand, uh, probably not what you want with everyone just calling everything Ozempic, but at least they are recognizing the brand name. So I wonder how, how that's been for you, knowing that this became sort of celebrity culture and, you know, it's been everywhere this year. Yeah, it's, it's a big change. Uh, I've been with a company for more than 30 years. I'm only the fifth CEO in a hundred year old company. And now we're growing, uh, you know, around 30%, a hundred years into our our lifetime. And suddenly we have brands that are becoming household names. Uh, and we've never ever had products that were like, you know, widely known. <clears throat> so I think it, it's, um, it causes some challenges how to handle that, but also it drives a lot of opportunity. And if you think about, as I mentioned before, uh, over some time, hundreds of millions of patients uh, living with obesity and, and for us to, to get to them, if we had to uh, have a huge sales force to go to each and every person, we would never be able to get to, to many of them. But with brands being established, there's a different opportunity of actually reaching more patients. And again, when we can drive uh, health resilience, uh, stronger health outcomes by doing that, it's actually really, really nice to have brands that leads patients to seek care because we can drive even bigger change than what we could have done if these uh, were not well-established brands. So it caused a lot of change for us. We have to face different challenges, but I see it really as a big opportunity for helping society and get to many more patients than we've ever done uh, so far in the history of the company.
Yeah, it's really interesting because you have, you're, you're sort of like a fashion house now. You have to deal with knockoffs, especially while you still have the shortage ongoing. So th that must be an interesting position. But I want to talk about the company itself. It's got an interesting corporate structure. We know that uh, you were recently compared to even what's going on with OpenAI and having a very different corporate structure. How does that uh, get affected with this success? Who wins at the end of the day? And how do you personally feel about, you know, how the success is impacting the company? I, I would say that what we do uh, inside the company has not changed at all. So I mentioned that we've been researching in, in obesity for 25 years. That continues. We've been producing medicines for people living with uh, diabetes and, uh, and a few other diseases for, for 100 years. So, so the, the activities inside the company continues. We have an ownership structure that's interesting in the sense that we're controlled by a foundation. So the, the founders of, of Novo Nordisk actually gave control of the company to a foundation because they felt that that would be the best long-term ownership uh, for the company. And then, of course, we are listed on the stock market. So we have the, the discipline that comes from being listed company and uh, assessing, uh, you know, the market is assessing our performance on a daily basis. But then we also have this uh, stable anchor in the foundation, which has a controlling stake, and they have a really a, a forever mindset in what we do. Um, and that's a bit how we look at our business, that we're in this uh, forever. So we're not uh, chasing short-term returns, but we're really trying to build value for the long-term uh, with an eye for uh, the social responsibility we have, the environmental responsibility we have, and of course, staying a, a healthy company from a financial point of view. So these triple bottom lines we, we pursue is kind of guiding everything we do. And I think that creates a, a very good long-term perspective uh, and a, a balance of succeeding as a company, but also adding value to the society we, we serve. Absolutely. One of the things that's really interesting about the company, largest uh, corporate taxpayer in Denmark, you've also uh, got a, a little bit of an interesting uh, setup when it comes to, you know, the way that you pay out with the innovation that you support. I was actually overseas recently and, and someone told me from the University of Copenhagen, nothing happens without Novo. So huge compliments uh, for the company there. But meanwhile, looking at all of that, you have the broader healthcare system to worry about, the products you're supplying. Uh, as I mentioned, known for insulin largely in the past. And that was kind of a surprise that we saw in the Medicare drug pricing negotiations this year uh, that were announced. I wonder, do you think that Ozempic and Wagovi could be on the list further down the line? And are you preparing for that? Yeah, it's, it's a good point that uh, a company should stay really uh, on a sustainable growth track. You have to have continuous innovation. And uh, in our industry, when products have been on the market for some time and uh, you face patent expiration or uh, healthcare reforms, typically there'll be pressure on, on pricing. So we see now that our a long time uh, short acting uh, insulin f family of, of products in the US is now being included in this, uh, say, new uh, approach to negotiate pricing by the government. Um, and uh, we'll have other products potentially in the future um, being included in that. But what we're focused on in Nordrosk is really to continuously drive innovation. And as long as you, you succeed in being innovative in our industry, you'll be adding value based on bringing better and better versions of your prior products. And that's the way to get to more patients and also protect value because uh, you bring a, a better offering. So, so whether it's always bringing complications when you have to face uh, government uh, interventions and, and, uh, and negotiations, um, it just underlines the importance of having a, a strong strategy that's focused on bringing better and better products to patients. And if you succeed with doing that, then you have the growth trajectory of what we see in Ornosk uh, today. And uh, a company that's even turning 100 years can still be in its strongest position uh, because over decades, continued innovation has led to stronger and stronger medicines. So yes, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to deal with, but it's also a call for just having a continued focus on how we as a company add value. And that's via our scientists, uh, the innovation we bring to patients. 
I wonder, you're now at this juncture where you finally got to the finish line on finding the, you know, the sweet spot, that magic number that everyone's happy with in terms of the weight loss. And you've talked a lot about how all of this is because of where we are in society today, how we live, what we do, uh, and how it's different from, you know, when you were younger. So we've seen a lot of sort of doomsday predictions for other sectors as a result of the success of this drug or these drugs. How, what do you think about that? There's everything from food and beverage to airlines, clothing, apparel, you know, potential gambling and addiction benefits. How do you think that that's going to pan out? Do you think do you think it's really going to have that much of an impact? Yeah, it's it's a great uh, great question, and uh, it's it's really fascinating for us to reflect on how big an impact we might have. So when it comes to consumption of, of fuel for airlines, some of the med tech companies uh, involved in sleep apnea, uh, dialysis, to you know drinks and snacks companies, etc. Um, I think there'll be uh, an impact that is coming over many years. Uh, so, so I think it's maybe a bit dramatic what is being uh, depicted right now. But of course, it's, it reflects that when you assess the value of a company and you discount the future cash flows to today's uh, value, it's of course the impact over many years that's then reflected in today's price. And then you see sudden reactions. So my, my view is that some of those reactions are perhaps a bit exaggerated. But, but there's no doubt that uh, with the intervention we see now with the gf one based uh, medicines, you see significant shift in consumer behavior. And, uh, and, and some of these categories will be impacted. I think it's gradual or quite some time. Um, so my, my base view is that it's perhaps a bit uh, of an overreaction. Uh, but I take it as a strong a sign of, of what is it actually, uh, say, the, the power of the medicine we're introducing now is having on society, which of course is then also leading to that there is a strong case in actually paying for that innovation uh, coming from Law Noise. Absolutely. Do you think that with the, with the result from the select trial, um, you know, for the cardiovascular benefit, does this now open the door for more M&A in different disease areas for the company? You've, you've really had such a, such a year. What are you thinking about? Yeah, it's, it's a good point that uh, we can see that when we take uh, our molecule into new settings like cardiovascular disease, uh, you're also touching upon kidney disease and, and, and other adjacent disease areas. That means that we are expanding our growth platform and uh, we have a, a, a disciplined way of expanding. So we follow a molecule to a, to a new market and then we can start building there. So we are right now looking for assets uh, and acquiring and licensing assets in the cardiometabolic space. Um, so it's the, the development of semaglutide in first diabetes and obesity and the broader application of that creates a platform for us then to do non-organic non deals and, uh, and acquire innovation from outside and really say complement and, and, and bolster our position in new uh, therapeutic areas. And I think that's a very interesting growth strategy um, and uh, it's also needed as one always has to replenish our pipeline going forward and that takes more and more assets. But we're starting early and I'm quite optimistic in terms of how we can build value by taking early assets in and then add value to, value to those assets and thereby value to our shareholders compared to if you buy marketed products or late stage assets, you tend, typically have to pay fully up uh, and there's limited return to our shareholders. So we would like to do it early add value to it and uh, take the risk and hopefully also the earnings that come from that. Fascinating. What an exciting time to be leading the company. We'll have to leave it there. Lars Jorgensen, CEO of Nova Nordisk, congratulations again and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me today.